So I'll just remind you all, if you ever want to print these out, I made PDF versions of all of the notes for this unit. They are on Google Classroom. Uh, what we need to talk about today is, first of all, what motion is, what uniform motion is, and then how to calculate some things about motion. So we're starting this unit, which is the physics unit. Technically, it's called energy flow and technological systems. Makes it sound very fancy, but this is the physics unit. Uh, so this unit is the one that can give you a good idea of whether or not you like physics and you'd like to pursue it. It's also the unit that I use to recommend people for next year. Uh, so once we're done this unit, I could tell you what I would recommend that you would take. It's not a secret. Uh, I'll also recommend it electronically through our marking system. Uh, but once we've done these three, realistically, I can make a good recommendation of what you should take next year. So the first thing that we need to talk about is what motion is. Basically, everything that we're going to discuss in this unit involves something that is moving or that could be moving or that will move in the future. And so when we talk about motion, we are talking about the changing, and I'm underlining the word changing because it's key. If there's no change, then there's no motion. And we'll see that in basically every calculation we do, we're going to base it off the change in something. And so just so we can make a link later on, if you see in a physics formula, a triangle. It means change. And you'll see that they're all over the place in physics formulas. So motion is the changing in position of an object relative to a reference point. So the idea of change is key and the idea of a reference point is key. If I don't know where the object started, how can I tell you that it changed its position? Now what we'll see is that a lot of the time, the reference point will be zero. We'll call wherever we were to start zero in terms of distance, zero in terms of time. It won't always be that way, but if it's not otherwise stated, zero will be our reference point. Now if I want to think about what this means in the actual physical world, motion is like we drew an imaginary line between the object and its reference point and then we figured out how long it was and which way it went. So motion is the changing in position of an object relative to a reference point, which is an imaginary line joining the object to the reference point that changes in length and or direction. Now in the first section, we are only going to focus on how far the object went, not which direction it went, but we'll add direction in the second set of lessons. So to the right of this, I have a picture of someone kicking their leg forward and kicking their leg backward. Uh, it's a test that you could do to see range of motion to de determine if you have an injury. The way the person is sitting originally is the reference point. And if I wanted to determine or describe the motion of their foot, I would literally measure the distance between the reference point where they started and where their foot ended up when they kicked it forward or backward. I could measure how far it was or I could measure how far it was and which way it was. And that's how you describe what motion is. It's when an object changes its position compared to a reference point. If I asked you to describe what motion is and you didn't say something about a reference point, 
I don't think that I would give you the mark. You don't have to use that exact term, but you have to give me an idea that we are going to compare before and after. Where is the object now? Where was it before? Now that's the description just of motion. Is there anything in there that someone would like to ask about or uh, maybe any description someone would like more information about? So the first type of motion that we are going to discuss, this is a type, is called uniform motion. Now, does anybody know what the word uniform means? Like you're on a sports team and you wear uniforms. What does that mean? What's a uniform for? Why do you wear them? All right, I'm going to ask someone. You play on a hockey team, Ryan. Why do you guys wear uniforms? Because you're on the same team. And so the word uniform is talking about being the same. So uniform doesn't just apply to clothes that you wear. It applies to objects and motion as well. The word uniform means that things are the same. Things are consistent. And so sports teams wear uniforms, so they all look the same, so we know who goes with who. If this was STS and you guys had to wear uniforms to school, you would all look the same in terms of your clothes. That's what uniform is talking about. So uniform motion is when an object travels at a constant rate, so the same rate. When we say rate, you could think about the word speed. So uniform motion is when an object travels at a constant rate, so the same speed, in a straight line. And then I put a note that it's very hard to achieve this. And I'll give you an example to show you why. Uh, to the left, I put a little picture of a road that's obviously going up and down hills and around bends. Uh, and so I'm thinking about driving a car. Now, even though you don't all have your licenses, probably you have all tried driving a car. Perhaps you haven't. Uh, but in your car, you have something called cruise control. Cruise control is designed to make you go at the same speed. Uh, if you have ever been in the car when cruise control is on or used it yourself, you might be aware that even when cruise control is on, if you start going up a hill, your car slows down a little bit. It realizes pretty quickly, and the gas pedal will get pressed in farther, and the car will speed up. But there will be a brief moment where the speed is not the same. And so one reason that uniform motion is very hard to achieve is because of gravity. If you are traveling anywhere but on a completely flat surface, there's a very real probability that the effect of gravity is going to change because your height above the surface of the Earth is going to change. Uh, the same thing would apply if you're going down a hill. When you go down a hill, your car will start to speed up until cruise control realizes, oh shoot, I'm going too fast, and then it will slow your engine down. Gravity is one thing. Another thing I'm going to mention is friction. Because we live on Earth and we have an atmosphere, even if you don't think that you're touching something, you're touching air. And so regardless of where you are on Earth, whether you're on land or in the water or in air, there is friction between you and the particles around you. It could be an actual solid surface, like walking on the ground. Uh, it could be water that you're swimming through, which is really easy to visualize. Water slows you down. Or it could simply be air. All of those things cause friction. So gravity and friction, with, which are both forces that can act on an object, they're not the only forces, but they're two really common ones that we see, are two really good reasons that it's really hard to achieve uniform motion. Uh, in other words, it's really hard to stay in a perfectly straight line and to go exactly the same speed. Now the other thing that I'll mention on this topic is the word heat. Heat is not a force, it's a measurement of thermal energy, but whenever two objects have friction between them, heat is usually produced and some energy is lost. And so 
One of the reasons that friction would make uniform motion hard is because friction kind of sucks away some of the energy put into the object, meaning that not all of the energy is used for movement. Some of it is used to overcome friction. And so at the end of the unit, we're going to talk about efficiency uh, and how much energy is actually used for motion. And that's where the idea of heat will really come into play. Uh, but it could be something that you could use if I were to ask you, why is uniform motion hard to achieve? Uh, now, does anyone want to ask anything about motion or about uniform motion? So we're going to talk about our first calculation. Now, this is on your formula sheet that I gave you at the beginning of the semester, the booklet that has your periodic table in it, has a sheet with a bunch of formulas on it that you probably have not looked at, maybe ever, but at the very least you probably haven't taken that booklet out since we did chemistry. Uh, you will want to dig that little data booklet out and have it so that you have all of these physics formulas available to you. Now this is the only one we're going to talk about for right now, so you're not going to be in desperate need of a formula sheet. Uh, what I'd like to do is describe to you what all of the pieces are in the formula, what units you measure them in, and then I'll show you some examples of calculating with the formula so that I can show you how it works and how to manipulate it. So first of all, what are we talking about here? We are talking about average speed. If you continue with physics later on, you might learn about instantaneous velocity, uh, but we are always going to talk about speed as an average. Over a length of time, how fast was this object going for that whole entire time? So we are assuming uniform motion. If we don't assume uniform motion, our calculation gets very sticky and very tricky. So we are going to assume that uniform motion is happening. So average speed is where we go a specified distance in a specified time. So we're not worried about are there little ups and downs in the speed. We're worried about how far did the object go and how long did it take. So in the formula, the V represents speed. And you might say to yourself, well, that's dumb. Why does V represent speed? Um, there are a number of reasons. One, there are just too many things uh, for a letter to only represent one thing. But also, uh, the next topic we'll talk about is velocity, which is speed with a, di with a direction included on it. And so that they have the same letter, they're both represented with a V. Speed is most often measured in meters per second but sometimes can be measured in kilometers per hour, especially if we're talking about a car, a plane, a boat, some sort of transportation vehicle. But the standard unit is meters per second. So I'm mentioning this because if you know what unit your answer is supposed to be in, that can tell you what formula you should be calculating. Now the D stands for distance. Distance is usually measured in meters, although it could be kilometers if speed was in kilometers per hour. And the T stands for time, which is most often measured in seconds. So most of the time, speed will be in meters per second, distance will be in meters, time will be in seconds. Now, I mentioned earlier that if you see a triangle in a physics formula, it means change. And so if I read what this formula is saying, it's saying that speed is equal to the change in distance divided by the change in time. So that means that if I were to write out this formula in sort of a longer way, here's what I'm really saying. Whenever you see this change symbol, this little triangle, which is the Greek letter delta, it means take your final number and subtract your initial number from it. So this idea here is what we mean by change. I need to know where did I start and where did I finish in terms of both distance 
and time. Now very frequently, very frequently, your initial distance and your initial time will both be zeros. And unless the question actually states that you have some other value as your initial value, it will probably be zero. Now that will change when we start talking about changing directions and speeding up and slowing down. But for now, when we're talking about speed, average speed, most of the time, initial distance is zero and initial time is zero. Now the other thing I want to mention, because this has to do with the order of operations, is that we have to remember that it's like there are brackets there. I have to do what's on top of my formula and what's on the bottom before I divide them. So in this scenario, I would subtract those two distances and subtract the two times first, then I would divide them. And so even though the brackets aren't written, the order of operations tells us that I should do those two things first. So if you want to write brackets uh, that I would not take any marks off for it just because it's not on the formula sheet. So in my first example, I'll just show you where the numbers would go in the formula uh, and we'll remind ourselves about significant digits. So in the first example, a person is walking 10 meters away from a stop sign in five seconds. So this is not a mathematically very strenuous calculation. It's just so that I can show you where the numbers go. 10 meters is our distance. Five seconds is our time. Now it doesn't tell me where I started and where I stopped specifically. Just that I went 10 meters away. So I'm going to call that my final distance. I'm going to call that my final time. Because after five seconds, 10 meters was as far as I went. So in this question, where I'd like to calculate speed, I do the change in distance divided by the change in time. So what does that look like? Well, final minus initial distance over final minus initial time. Now I know my final distance, it's 10.0 meters, and I know my final time, it's 5.0 seconds. Now the question doesn't say what my initial time is, and so here's where you understand that it's implied. If we're just giving you the total, that means that we're thinking that we started at zero. So my initial distance was zero, my initial time was zero. Now since I have to do the adding or subtracting on either side of the fraction first, I would have to do those subtractions first. Now because I'm subtracting zero, it's not changing my answer. What it's really telling me is I'm doing 10 divided by 5. So my answer in this question is 2. Now I have to ask myself a couple of things and these are things I will always check and that you would lose marks if you didn't do or you didn't do correctly. First thing I want to check is significant digits. This value, this measured value that I used in my calculation has three significant digits. This value has two significant digits. Now the zeros that I used, I put them there. I didn't measure them. Uh, and things that aren't measured, we can't consider for significant digits. So those zeros, this zero here and this one here, have unlimited significant digits. Because I didn't actually measure them, uh, I'm not going to use them to change the number of significant digits I have. I'm only going to base my answer on numbers that were measured. That means that 5.0 has two significant digits. That's the lowest amount. My answer 
also has to have two significant digits. So I added 0, 0.0 instead of just writing 2. So now I have two significant digits. My unit is meters per second. Why is my unit that? Because I took meters and I divided them by seconds. So my unit is meters per second. Yes. Because you always have to report your answer with the same amount of precision, so the same amount of preciseness that you measured with. So I can't be more precise, but I also can't be less precise. Uh, does anyone have questions here, either about significant digits, units, the formula, anything that they'd like to ask? So my next three examples are to illustrate to you some things about rounding and scientific notation, but also how to manipulate formulas. Uh, so in each of these questions, uh, you are going to use the formula a different way. In the first question, I'm asking you to calculate the average speed. So you're going to use the formula exactly the way it was written. That is the only version that shows up on your formula sheet. If I were to ask you to calculate something different, like how long it will take, so the time, or the distance, you have to rearrange the formula to find the piece that you're looking for. So if I'd like to calculate time, time will be equal to distance divided by speed. If I'm going to calculate distance, distance will be equal to speed multiplied with time. Now those two versions of the formula are not on the formula sheet. And so what I'd like for you to do is, aside from trying these calculations, uh, is to make sure that you could figure out or that you understand how to get from the original formula to those two versions. I'll show you afterwards when I show everybody these questions, uh, but I'd like for you to think about it yourself. Uh, the rule is that I can do whatever I want to a formula as long as I do the same mathematical operation to both sides. If I do it on both sides, I can do whatever I feel like. Uh, and so that is how I rearrange those formulas. Again, I'll show this to you afterwards, but what I'd like first, so in the first question, you don't have to change the formula from the way it looks on your formula sheet. So you simply need to put the numbers in where they go. I know that change in distance over change in time means final minus initial distance over final minus initial time. Now, since in this question, it's not telling me that I had an initial time or an initial distance, I know that both of those values are zeros. When they're both zeros, it's not going to change my calculation realistically at all. I'm going to have 4.0 times 10 to the power of 16 meters on top, minus zero. And on the bottom, 3.6 times 10 to the power of 4 seconds, minus 0. Now, since I'm subtracting 0, it's not changing anything at all for my calculation. So what I'm really just doing is this. Now, when you type this into your calculator, and I mentioned this to a few people, I highly recommend that instead of typing 4.0 times 10 to the power of 16, you use on your calculator in the place of this the E button. Now, it doesn't look the same on everybody's calculator. On a TI calculator like mine, it's second function comma, which is the key right above the number 7. On a few other calculators, you'll see it's called EXP. Uh, or t 10 with an X next to it. If you're unsure of how to get this function on your calculator, please tell me so that I can show you. If you have a scientific calculator, it will do it somehow. It's simply us figuring out where the button actually is. 
The reason that you do this, and it's really important, is because when you just type 4 times 10 to the power of 16, your calculator doesn't know that you mean for that to be all one number. That that's not just a math operation, that that's actually a number written in scientific notation. If for some reason you have a thing against the E button, I recommend that you put brackets if you're going to type it all out. If you're going to type times 1, 0 to the power of something, you need brackets, otherwise your calculator does not know that that power of 10 goes with another number. Now, once you've got it in your calculator properly, you should get 1.1111111 times 10 to the power of 12. Now, on your calculator, here's another thing that I'll point out. Your calculator, in most cases, won't write times 10 to the power of. There will be a little e, or there might not even be a symbol. It'll just look like two little small numbers off to the side. You can't write calculator shorthand as your answer. If this is the answer, you have to write times 10 to the power of. So please do that. Don't just recopy whatever shorthand or abbreviation your calculator uses. Now, in terms of rounding, there are two significant digits in each of my original values. Remember, the times 10 to the power of part does not count as significant, so that's not going to be part of my answer. So that means I have to round this off so that there are only two digits. So I'm going to get rid of all of those extra ones and just leave 1.1 as my answer. It's times 10 to the power of 12, and since I was dividing meters and seconds, my answer is in meters per second. Uh, is there anything in that first question that somebody would like to ask about here? So in the second question, the first thing I'd like to show you is how I got this formula. I got this formula by taking my original formula, V equals delta D over delta T, and rearranging it. The key thing is that whatever I want to find has to be alone, and it has to be on top. So it cannot be on the bottom of a fraction, and it has to be all by itself on one side of the equation. Now, you might remember a little shortcut I told you. Uh, it's that these two numbers can trade places and your formula is still valid. And that's true. But I'm going to show you once more time, another time mathematically how that works. This formula works the same way that the mole formula works in the chemistry unit. You have three variables in the formula. So if I would like t for, be, to, for t to be all alone on one side of the equation, I have to start moving things. So my first step will be that I'm going to multiply both sides by delta t. Doing that makes it cancel out on the right. That's good. Now it's not on the bottom anymore. I moved it to the top. My second step is that I don't want this v on the same side as t. So I'm going to divide both sides by v. That makes V cancel out on this side. If I read everything that's not canceled out, T is equal to D over V. So what I did was always perform the same mathematical operation. As long as I do it on both sides of the equation, that's valid. So my actual values then, my distance is 4.00 times 10 to the power of 7 meters. My time, or my speed, sorry, is 694 meters per second. Now notice that I'm not even writing minus 0. And it's because I recognize that that's the total distance uh, and the speed. So I don't need to subtract 0 from it. And I would not take off a mark if you decided not to write that you were subtracting 0. Uh, the only time that it's really crucial that we have that initial and final is when there's actual values to compare it to. So when we're calculating, uh, it's OK to me, for me if you recognize that the change in distance was 4 times 10 to the power of 7. I don't need a subtraction to show me that. 
Now in this question, my answer is quite large. My answer is 57,637 seconds. It's actually longer than that, but I just didn't keep writing all of the decimal places. That's too many significant digits. And so I have to do something to my answer uh, so that there are fewer. I'm only allowed to have three significant digits. Both of my original values only had three significant digits. So my first choice, which is the one that I typically recommend, is use scientific notation. In scientific notation, you take the decimal and you move it so that there's only one number in front of it. So in this case, I would have moved the decimal one, two, three, four times. And then I could write 5.76 times 10 to the power of 4 seconds. I wrote times 10 to the power of 4 because I moved the decimal 4 places. I rounded it to 5.76 instead of 5.7637 so that I only had three significant digits. Now another option that you have uh, is to change the unit. This might not always be a possibility, but I could, for example, uh, take my value 57,637 seconds and change it into minutes. If I divided this by 60, I would get 961 minutes. I could divide it by 60 again uh, and get 16.0 hours. Those all have three significant digits. They all represent the same amount of time. So if I didn't tell you which unit I wanted as the answer, you would be free to change the unit to give yourself the correct number of significant digits. Now, it's not as common with time values, but especially with distance values where you have uh, millimeters, meters, kilometers that are all just powers of 10 different from each other, it's pretty common to change distance units uh, so that you have the correct number of significant digits. Now that's the second example. Would anybody like to ask any questions either about how we changed the formula, about how we rounded the answer off, maybe about scientific notation here? So then the third example is asking us to find distance. So how did I get that formula? Well, here's my original formula. I wanted distance to be all by itself on one side of the equation. So I had to get rid of time. How did I do that? I multiplied both sides by time. That made time cancel out on the right and show up on the other side. So that means that time multiplied with speed equals distance. Now you'll notice that I wrote it from left to right the first time and then it's written from right to left the next time. It doesn't matter which side you put your unknown variable on, both of those formulas are exactly the same thing. So whether you write it like this, or whether you write it like this, you're calculating the same thing, and I don't care which way you choose to write it. Uh, now in this case, I'm multiplying speed and time, so I'm going to take 6.9 meters per second, and multiply that with 4.0 seconds. Now my answer that I get before I round it off is 27.6. Since I can only have two significant digits, this number has two, this number has two, my answer can only have two as well. So that means that I'll round this off to 28. Now since I was calculating distance, but also because I look at my units, I'll see that I had seconds and then something divided by seconds, that means that that unit cancels out, and I'm left with only meters as my answer. And this is where you need to do a logical check. Can you measure distance in seconds? No, uh, and so when you're putting your unit on, look back, ask yourself what was the question asking me to find, and make sure that your unit represents that. Uh, does anyone have any questions about any of those examples there? 
So I'd like for you to take out 